the 345 session, the uses of public memory in the rural American Midwest. Uh, my name is David Ward. I'm an assistant professor here at Grand Valley State University. Uh, I'll be chairing the session, and how I'll run it is I'll introduce uh, our first speaker, give the paper, and then I'll introduce the second speaker, they'll give their paper, and then I'll introduce the third speaker, and they will give their paper. Um, and then I'll have a few brief comments, and then we'll hopefully have plenty of time for um, discussion at the end. So our first paper is by uh, Nancy Burlog. Uh, she grew up on a, uh, from Texas State University. She grew up on a corn and soybean and beef cattle farm, a mile outside a town of 650 people near Galena, Illinois. Her family still operates the farm. She received a BA from the University of Chicago, MA and PhDs from the John Hopkins University. She's currently an assistant professor of history and public history at Texas State University. Last summer, her book, Farmer Helping Farmer, Farmers Helping Farmers, The Rise of the Farm and Home Bureaus, 1914 to 1935, was published by the Louisiana State University Press and recently won an award from the Iowa State Historical Society for one of the best books in the Iowa history. Before returning to academia in 2012, she served as chief editor and senior historian for the historical office of the Secretary of Defense with the Pentagon and as assistant editors for the papers of Dwight David Eisenhower Project at John Hopkins University. She's the co-editor, co-author of books on books entitled Pentagon 9-11 and History of the National Eye Institute. She's glad to return to her roots with this new, it's interesting, I'm sure, just who knew? Yeah. She's glad to return to her roots with a new project on Midwestern rural films, cooperatives, Farm, home decor, and pageantry. The title of her paper is The Uses of the Past Public Memory and Farm Historical Pageantry During the 1920s. Nancy. All right. Uh, so thank you very much for everybody for being here and to my co panelists. I very much appreciate that. So um, this is very much a new project that I'm mulling over from lots of different angles, so kind of playing with it. Um, I'm particularly interested in historical pageantry in the 1920s and 10s and its own phenomenon, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. But I teach courses, uh, graduate courses in public history and memory, where we do a lot of discussion about how do publics learn memory, um, and just how malleable memory is, and how it gets used by different groups in service of different kinds of things, um, and how historical memory is often quite different in the public than what academics um, are talking about. So I'm trying to bring all those interests together with this beginning project. So I'm going to talk today about two historical pageants that were staged in northern Illinois by two different institutions. Now they both use the same um, similar imagery, um, same sort of plot lines, especially featuring themes of progress and the frontier. And yet there are important differences. And I maintain that each of these uh, different historical constructions uh, serve the aims of each sponsoring institution. Uh, and this comes out with, the, with uh, particularly in the trajectory of progress in the future. They both uh, project that in very different ways. So thus, they clearly illustrate how public uh, historical memories are constructed, thus disseminated, and used in order to shape the 1920s hopefully in the eyes of the authors and audiences of the future. So this craze for historical pageantry swept through America in the 1910s and 20s. Uh, what it involved is communities across the nation would recruit its local edit, uh, lo local residents excuse me, to write, stage, and act in productions of their own community's history. Mostly communities, not so much organizations. Um, spoke, uh, scholars have to date focused primarily on urban pageantry or town pageants. They really haven't looked at farm pageantry or rural pageantry. And it was a phenomenon in the rural area. So I'm interested in looking at that. Uh, urban or rural, these conventions all sort of file, uh, follow these same highly stylized conventions. Um, the pageants told history through a series of episodes. Um, the episodes had no dialogue. It involved residents um, acting out in pantomime or tableau vivant, the uh, historical scene. And then you'd have a narrator on stage who'd be reading a text, often a very florid, sentimentalized text, um, you know, this imagined uh, history of your community. Um, 
Also, there were some interesting stock symbols of the 1920s, um, particularly um, patriotic figures like Jefferson and George Washington, obviously not unusual. Um, in these two pageants, neither of them can appear, but Abraham Lincoln does. So I, you know, there's a little bit of regionalism going on there. Also, they're filled with all kinds of classical figures. Uh, Columbia, Pomona, always dressed in these noble, you know, these robes to portray noble characteristics and um, you know, sashes. Also, spirits seem to be everywhere in these plays. Um, and things like sprites and imps and fairies are frolicking around on stage. So it's a, it's a very interesting kind of uh, cultural uh, symbolism going on here. Um, so the pageants were quite the spectacle, and probably most of these rural audiences had never seen anything like this. Of course, uh, uh, films were coming to rural areas at this time, uh, but they were, these pageants could be quite large scale, involving hundreds of residents and viewed by thousands at the same time, as one of the plays was, which I'll talk about. Uh, so they very much had the power to impact how viewers saw history, at least how the pageant was constructing this history for the, the viewers. So the first pageant I'm going to talk about was staged by the DeKalb County Farm Bureau in 1922. And, uh, this is in uh, DeKalb, Illinois, to mark its 10-year anniversary as the first in the nation. And it was titled Forward Farm Bureau. And it was very uh, highly publicized, it was filmed by the American Farm Bureau Federation and then disseminated nationwide to its, its community bureaus. It had a cast of hundreds from 13 counties and thousands reportedly in the audience. And it was staged in a field um, on the grounds of Northern Illinois State Teachers College, um, now Northern Illinois, excuse me. And local bureau leaders uh, penned the script, uh, but they did hire a national recreation expert they were called in the day pageant masters to produce this particular pageant. So to begin a very brief overview of this overall, or of this pageant, uh, it uh, employs a very narrow focused agrarian lens to tell the history of agriculture in Illinois, and then how that led to the rise of the Farm Bureau, and then on to talk about the various glorious achievements of the Farm Bureau, mostly the scientific methods that the Farm Bureau promoted. Um, it, these methods ranged everywhere from, from anything from hog vaccination to boys and girls, clubs, to soil for, uh, fertility. There was even a parade of floats with those kinds of names um, that was filmed in the part of the pageant. So while it celebrated this, this tenure anniversary, it also offered a cautionary um, tale about the need to increase and expand such science and organizations if farmers in America were to be successful in the future. So the other pageant is a 1923 pageant uh, put on by Carroll County, and it celebrated its 100th anniversary over three days. Uh, it was titled The Century in Carroll County, and it portrayed a, a, a typical kind of pageant, community pageant history with progression of local um, history. Uh, they did mention some national events that they felt shaped the character of the county and its people. And it view history primarily from a community lens rather than an occupational perspective. Though it did talk a lot about agriculture because that was an economic and maybe so. Um, so in this narrative, uh, history unfolds very smoothly from the country's origins, uh, excuse me, from the county's origins, very smoothly through to the thriving present. There's no, you know, everything's a week that the future will look just like that. It depicted some of the local personages and local events. Um, Okay, so I want to talk about some of the similarities uh, in the opening of the two different pageants, and they, they really start with this mythical origin story of the land um, in, in Illinois. It's the story primeval of, of, of the forest of the prairie primeval. Um, the play, the pageants picture a land that was devoid of human activity, but it seemed to the flora and fauna. Uh, the Bureau of Pageants use such typical rhetoric as virgin soil, unbroken soil, untamed wild grasses to indicate this, this forest primeval. It, uh, it also, uh, I like this quote, it's a quote, for a million years the narrator, uh, for a million years the land has stored an untapped abundance. And I'll talk about that a, a little bit later, but it's a very telling statement. So the Carroll County pageant opens the other pageant opens by imagining a local setting 100 years earlier. 
And there the streams sing gaily, the sun kisses the faces of the wildflowers, the birds sing in triumphant chorus, and I'm quoting all those these, uh, lines. Uh, weeping fish appear, fearing, uh, furry forest bees, little prairie creatures, and they live side by side in harmony. And it is a land and time, the narrator says, where there was, quote, no strife, no hate, no turmoil. Uh, then there were interludes. All these pageants included interludes of singing and dancing, often of the most ridiculous lyrics you've ever um, come upon, but, uh, but, very but very telling, also very symbolic. The Carol pageant, for example, had youngsters who were out on stage, um, and they were meant to embody the prairies and the wildflowers. And you know, they've converted on stage, and they've uh, meant to bring life to, quote, the gentle winds, rippling, quote, the long prairie grass and the sun kissed flowers, thus the representation of Illinois there. Similarly, in the Farm Bureau pad pageant, young dance and song groups uh, gave voice, and that term is used, gave voice to the natural elements they view as characteristic of Illinois. The forest, flowers, birds, prairies, wind, uh, and rainbows, and raindrops. Um, so it essentialized it is, it is an untamed and unspoiled. The frolicking youngsters were ideal to symbolize the pristine landscape that Betsy, Betsy episode was talking about. So now I'm going to jump to the next section, the next episodes of the pageants, where they talk about the pioneer days on the Northern frontier. And this is only when chronological time actually starts for both of these plays. It only starts with the arrival of the first set of settlers. That's the only time history could progress forward. So the Farm Bureau pageant typically refers to pioneers uh, breaking soil, draining the sloughs, uh, cutting the timber. They served by quote, uh, survived by quote, sweat of the brow through quote, barter and exchange with the quote, frontier store. So they did use that word frontier. Um, and they talk about how crude um, agriculture was and how existent, non-existent community was. And that was depicted on stage in Pantomime. Uh, the Carroll County pageant similarly featured the first settlers who made their home in the, quote, new country, and that was Savannah, Illinois, it's a Mississippi River town. And it describes, quote, how strong-hearted forebears, end quote, suffered many hardships in the early days. And this included the terror of War of 1832. Then the episodes switch, both of them, switch next to this golden age of settlement. Um, uh, in each pit pageant, the hard pioneer phase was followed by a golden period with rapidly expanding settlements and societal, societal advancement, techno uh, farm technology advance, arms or fence, new farm inventions, schools, towns, commu uh, communities came into existence, and again, pantomimes portrayed this. Um, Carroll County, for example, has some hands minds where they made, they reenact the naming of Carroll County, they depict a settler wedding, um, and of course agricultural fair. And the narrator for Carroll County sums up this golden age, quote, men, women, and little children went forth with scythe and sickle to cut the grain, gleaming golden in the sun. Communities harvested and celebrated together, and there's feasting, joy, and dancing. So again, this sort of very simple, happy pastime. So it is in the late depiction of the 19th century where these uh, two pageants diverge, uh, again, over the trajectory of progress. Carroll County, as I said, face history as one of upward continuous advancement, and even such disruptions as the War of Rebellion, which that was the terminology used, with its uh, accompanying scene in the Lincoln-Douglas debates um, and World War, uh, the Great War, um, neither of these result in any um, real problems for Carroll County. Instead, they create greater national unity. Um, so life inevitably got better in this narrative. By 1923, the present, uh, children had gained recreational opportunities, adults had other churches, there were new agricultural organizations. Um, and then the final prompt prologue sounds, uh, or pounds home the celebration of progress with these lines, quote, Faster and faster turn the wheels of time and progress. More wonderful things each day brings forth. Wonders our fathers could never dream of." End quote. So characters on stage then illustrate the wonderful improvements. Transportation um, has shifted from over 100 years from auction to carts. Communication has changed from signal fires to radios. And women, their change is they no longer carry about jugs of water. 
Um, so the narrator's final lines predict continual progress for the county, um, going, quote, going onward, ever onward, building, 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 farms and villages, schools and churches, fields and vineyards. So viewed primarily through the lens of community, the pageant of Century Carroll County was what meant to instruct audiences on their heritage and how it could be a guide for the future. So using the past to just tell people what they should, uh, how they should be like in the future. And of course, it's a very selective vision of the past. It privileged technological progress rather than celebrating social or transformational trans uh, progress or change, such as, for example, giving the vote to women nationally in 1920, which had just occurred, not mentioned. And so, and the concluding lines um, request the county residents to guard this heritage from those who would despoil it. Now, they don't name who. Would, might despoil it, and yet it's clear that local leaders believe that maintaining the status quo in social and economic in the social and economic world would ensure an ideal future. So ultimately, this uh, pageant has very self-congratulatory air uh, and more than a tinge of smugness um, that left no room for reflexive questions about the social order of the day. And I'm very much reminded of the point made by Czech author Milan Kudera, uh, who wrote that kitschy historical memory served, quote, the need to gaze in the mirror of the beautifying lie and be moved to tears of gratification of one's own reflection. So to move on to the Forward Farm Bureau, which has a different um, understanding of progress. It constructs um, history in the late 19th century as, as not as questionable as progress is not inevitable. In fact, instead of going upward easily, it's a story of decline for farmers in the late 19th century. The quote, the golden grains uh, ripen more slowly than when our fathers planted and uh, cultivated. And then man is beset with problems. The results of his labors are severely molested. Grief attends him. And then these problems are depicted on stage by allegorical figures named depleted soils, inferior seeds, damaging insects, corrupt livestock, infectious disease, and inefficient production. And it points out how farmers um, are very slow to realize that the art of farming was not enough and that things uh, farmers need to employ <coughs> This is a picture from another pageant um, where you can get a sense of the costumes. Um, that This is supposed to sort of, I think, uh, be a little blighted potato. <laughs> and then there were also certified seed on stage and, and um, the, one of the spirits in that, that particular pageant. OK, so um, the Farm Bureau pageant recommends that science is only going to change um, the trajectory. And so finally, in 1912, after going very slowly, farmers were ready for a, quote, new day in agriculture, and to turn the tide for progress, they formed the Farm Bureau. And then the subsequent episodes, as I mentioned, describe the scientific methods. So history constructed in this way, where progress was in question and not inevitable, served the purposes of the organization. It was important to, to depict historical decline and ambiguity about the present, but also some hope in order to draw followers to the cause of scientific and organized agriculture. A history only of progress and celebration would have negated the need for the Bureau. Okay, so it is, uh, sorry, just eight. I want to say, argue also that um, both pageants, I'll go back and talk a little bit about this frontier narrative, which sounds really familiar today and, and may not seem, you know, why am I talking about but here in 1923, the, the narrative they're talking about is very much uh, related to the narrative of the trans Mississippi West, not a Midwestern narrative, nor is it an, an Eastern uh, narrative. Historical pageants of this time usually presented Eastern states um, in their relationship to Europe and migration. They made pilgrims, Puritans, and Plymouth Rock central to their historical origins. They uh, chronicled the colonial period. Founding fathers, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson. Now, um, some of the Western pageants did also, um, but not in the, the rural pageants I found. The patriots featured in these um, rural pageants are the common man, um, much more than Jefferson. So the art historian William Putner has pointed out how in the late 19th century, 
chronicles and imagery of American expansion had, ex uh, excuse me, had solidified into two orientations, one towards New England and the other towards the West. And these pageants chose sort of a Western pioneer narrative. So this narrative offers a select and edited history that replicated in short forms the ideas of manifest destiny that had become so dominant by the mid 19th century. By the late 19th century, art and literature was helping to construct this narrative of empty Western land, you know, ready for the taking, a land of endless opportunity for courageous and heroic pioneers. Um, indeed, popular artists invented potent images of abundant wilderness, frontier, and settlement that long gripped mass popular culture, and then we see these in these Midwestern pageants. So in examining the pageants uh, images of the origins of Illinois, um, I was reminded a little bit of the canvases of um, Albert Bierstadt, um, who had these huge canvases of, of empty land. He's more north, known for depicting the, uh, the west. Here we go. Pictures like this, and I'm sure you're, you, you've seen them. I was also reminded of with this frontier narrative, they're telling the classic picture of American progress um, by John Guest. So um, I'm going to skip here to the end because I'm running out of time. But I do want to argue, make the sort of pontificating final point, which is that um, these pageants were offering exclusionary selective memory. Um, these history constructions, they, the, the pageants applied to the public were forced exclusionary. They rendered groups and aspects of history uh, to the margins um, or rendered them invisible. For example, it privileged white males, there are no women, or they uh, appear on the edge of, of the story. Um, and Native Americans either appear not at all or as tragic, um, terrorizing figures tropes and that ultimately simply go away through displacement, not through conflict, and there is no, um, no conquest except the brief Black Hawk War. Um, it, uh, let's see. So the lack of social, racial, ethnic, gender, or even occupational diversity homogenized history, and they implicitly idealized pioneers, farmers, and residents as Anglo. And the term Anglo and Saxon were not atypically used uh, in previous pageants. So my point here is not to impose a more current historical interpretation retroactively to these pageants. Rather, I'm looking at the manner in which these mythical presentations of a Western-type frontier captured the immigration, or excuse me, captured the imagination of generations of America, and how these were used to drive larger political and social agendas at, of the time. We see this uh, on display in the two pageants examined here. Um, the presentation, this pioneer narrative continues to have dominance in American culture and history, particularly among public audiences, um, despite the provisionism of the new Western history we find in academia. Um, and and more than that, just, um, indeed, we all probably recognize these tropes of pioneer frontier progress because they're everywhere. Um, but the, these pageants you know, really depicted these origins on some level as, as truth, as history. And so this reunification, I think, continues with the, the vengeance. And you, um, you see this, some of you may remember the controversy over the West's America exhibit in 1991 um, in the Smithsonian, which challenged some of this pioneer narrative. Um, and it caused this huge outpour um, um, with the Pope. Some publics, many publics, have argued this was destroying the image of America. Um, so, to end with a final uh, couple of sentences, I want to use a quote by cultural historian David Glassberg, who says, quote, the power to define what particular version of history becomes the public history is an awesome power indeed. And this is something the organizers of Farm Forward Farm Bureau and the Carroll County Pageant understood. And it's reflecting the decision they made to stage pageant and in the selection of what histories to tell. However, consciously done, the select versions met the public purposes of the pageants, and still such public memory continues to be reiterated over and over again during the installments.
Um, our next paper it will be given by David Broadnex. David is a uh, professor of history at Trinity Christian College in Palos Heights, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago. Um, he received his BA from Illinois Wesleyan, a JD from the University of Iowa Law School, and an MA and PhD from Northwestern University. Um, he's been working on African Americans in Iowa, uh, mostly, uh, including a published article, Will They Fight? Ask the Enemy, the story of the 60th U.S. Colored Infantry, Iowa's African American Civil War Regiment in the Annals of Iowa, and uh, has given many presentations, including They Would Die There As Soon As Anywhere, Black Iowans, Physical and Legal Resistance to Slavery, and Politeness and Obliging Manners. Race, Gender, Class, and Combination in Davenport, Iowa, 1830 to 1800. The title of this paper today is Their Old Comrade, Black Public Remembrances of Slavery, War, and Freedom, Dallas County, Iowa, 1860 to 1900. Okay. All right, did you sit or say? <laughs> I sit. I sit, or you sit. I'm going to, um, I mean, paper doesn't crash, but technology does, so I'm going to try this, hopefully this will work. So um, the title, um, thank you David for the introduction, the title is slightly different than it is in the program. Um, I took a paper that was already about Central Iowa and made it even narrower, and so um, hopefully there's still some uh, useful things in here. So my paper is looking at how African Americans in Dallas County, Iowa, use their individual and collective memory of slavery and the Civil War as a form of political, economic, and cultural capital. And so I'm focusing on one extremely small black community in Van Meter Township, um, Dallas County, Iowa. If there's any baseball fans in the room, this is where Bob Bello is from, and that's the only reason that anybody has ever heard of Van Meter Township, Dallas County, Iowa. Um, but it's looking at this black community, um, and the fact that they were isolated from the public gatherings that characterize most black public memory in Iowa and throughout the Midwest after the war. So not only is this a small community, but they're not even close to other black communities um, throughout Iowa or the Midwest. But they were nonetheless able to use the local press and the church and other institutions to publicize their memories of slavery in the war. This did not result in racial equality, but it did enable them to achieve certain small civil rights and economic victories that eluded other black people partly because local whites also benefited from this activity. And so by looking at these, this small community, we can expand, hopefully, our understanding of how public memory and racial progress are tied to certain demographic and socioeconomic conditions thought to only exist in large cities and in the rural south. So to put this another way, what I want to do is take the ways that African Americans after the Civil War sort of collectively remembered slavery and the war and freedom and look at how that applies in this small black community in the rural Midwest because this is an area that's not been looked at and to, to think about how was this small community able to achieve certain things even though they're completely outnumbered, right? So to kind of set the context here, for those of you who heard the title and said, I didn't know that there were black people in Iowa, <laughs> there are now. Um, yes, so when the Civil War started, there were slightly more than a thousand African Americans in the entire state of Iowa. Most of them lived in the eastern part of the, of the state, in cities and towns like Davenport and Mount Pleasant. And even though these black communities pale in comparison to black communities in places like Chicago or Cincinnati, or certainly eastern cities like Boston and New York, they were large enough to support black churches, black schools, and black businesses. By contrast, there were almost no African Americans in Central Iowa, whether in the capital city of Des Moines, or in nearby small towns, or in farm areas. So to put, this, uh, to, to put a number on this, um, as of 1860, in Des Moines and Polk County, which is where Des Moines is in, and in the eight counties that surround Polk County, there was a total of 60 African Americans in this entire nine county area around Des Moines. And one third of them were part of one family. <laughs> but then during the Civil War, Iowa's black population nearly quintuples in size. In the, eight, in the Des Moines County area, or sorry, in the Des Moines area, the population increases from 60 in 1860 to 567 by 1870. Most of the increase in Iowa was in the larger cities, but the black population in many small towns and rural areas 
also became home to a handful of African Americans. So what this means is that after the Civil War, although most black Iowans lived in urban communities where there were at least several hundred people, there were dozens of much smaller black communities scattered throughout the state. In some cases, these black communities consisted of one person. In other cases, of only one family. But previously, where there was nothing like this throughout Iowa, there's dozens of these communities um, in, around the state. One of these was in, again, Van Buda Township, Dallas County, Iowa. Uh, by 1870, there's 25 African Americans in Dallas County. This consisted of five families and one farm laborer who was a little white family. One of those five families was led by John and Madeline McKee, who are the focus of this paper. The McKees had fled from slavery in Tennessee during the war and had settled in, actually, western Illinois. From there, John McKee headed back east, we're still not clear why, and joined the Federal Army to, quote, help free his people from bondage. And then after that, they moved, in 1869, they moved to um, Dallas County, Iowa, where they lived with one of the only other black families until they were able to buy a farm of their own. Another thing that's important to mention is, and this is something else that surprises people, um, Iowa had a black civil war regiment. Um, there is, you know, even though there's only 1,000 African Americans in Iowa in 1860, according to the census, and you need about 1,000 people to fill a regiment, Iowa had its own black regiment, the 60th U.S. Colored Infantry, also known as the 1st Iowa Infantry African descent. And this is basically formed in, in, in essentially because there's so much black migration into the state. So this regiment consists of about 600 men who lived mostly in southeastern Iowa, in Davenport, in Des Moines, some in southwestern Iowa. And then even after all of them signed up, they still weren't enough to fill a regiment, so they went to St. Louis and, and found about 300 more. And so there's this regiment. Most of these men, as I just mentioned, had not lived in Iowa when the war started, but many of them decided to make their home there when the war ended, and so, of course, did uh, veterans of other reg regiments like John McKee. Uh, McKee's not a veteran in the 60th. He belonged to a regiment uh, actually in Rhode Island. But most of these veterans settled in larger cities like Davenport and Des Moines. So the McKees are unique in the sense that you know, not only is he, he's the only black veteran in the place where he lives because he's one of the only African Americans of any kind in the place where he lives. But even so, he and his wife are able to use their memories of slavery, freedom, and military service for personal and collective uplift. And so what I want to do now is sort of give a big picture in terms of black memory of slavery and the Civil War um, after the war and then sort of narrow in on the key. So who's heard of something called Emancipation Day? So Emancipation Day was basically one of the largest sort of black community institutions in the 50 years after the Civil War. This actually dates back to the 1830s when African Americans in the Northeast started commemorating the end of slavery in the British West Indies. And at that point, the celebration consisted of, hooray for people in Jamaica, we wish we could be like them. Right? Then once the Civil War starts, especially once the Emancipation Proclamation is issued, African Americans started celebrating the end of slavery in this country. And this happens all over the country, in the Midwest, in the Northeast, and in the South. The first such celebration in Iowa is in the town of Muscatine in 1857. Back then, Muscatine had the second largest black community in the state. And these celebrations throughout the country tended to follow a certain pattern. So they began with a morning procession from either the local black church or from a government building and then from there, the procession would wind through the black neighborhood to the local fairgrounds, led by brass bands and drum corps playing military songs, followed by a wagon that contained, the kick contained, sorry, that carried the quote-unquote goddess of liberty or the queen of liberty, who was usually the unmarried daughter of a prominent uh, black resident. And this carriage that she was uh, riding in was always decorated with patriotic bunting and images of Lincoln, always images of Lincoln, right? Then at the fairgrounds, there's always an opening prayer, speeches by white politicians and by black community leaders, personal testimonies by black veterans and by former slaves, musical selections, a recitation of the Emancipation Proclamation by the Goddess of Liberty, then supper, then more speeches, then the evening dance, and then sometimes a torchlight parade. So whether you're in the Midwest, the Northeast, or the South, this seems to be the pattern um, that was followed. These gatherings in Iowa drew thousands of people, including many whites. 
So why would white Iowans go to something that's celebrating the end of slavery, something that's being organized and led by African Americans? There's a couple of reasons for this. Many white Iowans had little contact with African Americans and had never traveled south, or it, most of them were veterans, they had not been south since they had served in the Civil War. And so they were drawn to the oratory, to the music, to the food, and to other aspects of black culture. I don't think I need to tell anybody that white America has been fascinated with black culture for a long time, right? So this is one sort of early 19th century way of tapping into that. Also, these gatherings feature things like baseball games, cycling races, once the Ferris wheels invented, there's Ferris wheels. So people who are from small towns and mid-sized towns are able to experience sort of the latest innovations in American culture and to, you know, to do fun things, right? Especially at the end of a long farming summer. Also, these gatherings serve as unofficial Republican rallies, especially in election years. White attendance was also facilitated by special discounted rates on the trains, and even though African Americans organized the rallies, white entrepreneurs made a lot of money. Um, obviously, they owned the train companies and, and made lots of money selling food and so forth at these events. And then also, even though these events had an emphasis on the black perspective on slavery and the war, Emancipation Day also became an important part of white collective memory. The Civil War was central to the identity of African Americans and white Americans alike. But for white Americans, especially white Iowans, it was central in a different way. And for rural white Iowans, it took on another level of importance that separated them even from their counterparts in big cities. White Iowans saw the Civil War as the central moment in the history of the state. Not an important moment, but the most important thing that ever happened in Iowa. Literally the thing that defined the state of Iowa. Iowa was a young state. Iowa only achieved statehood in 1848, and it had played no role in earlier conflicts. So for decades to come, or if you want to look at it more cynically, until the people who remember the Civil War were all dead, um, Iowans defined themselves individually and their state collectively by the fact that they had served in disproportionately high numbers in the Civil War, that they had helped win the Western theater of the war, and that they had helped defend the border with Missouri. And so an event that celebrated both races' participation in a righteous defense of freedom and patriotism against Southern freedom resonated with them just as it did with African Americans. But then this takes on another meaning um, in rural Iowa for other ways. And this is an interesting place where my paper intersects with yours, although maybe not in ways where they completely agree with each other, right? which is interesting, right? So not only did Iowa not have a narrative of involvement in, in earlier wars, but, you know, of course, this means that the, the state of Iowa has no narrative involvement in the Revolution, in the War of 1812, or the Mexican-American War, but it also lacked a narrative of wars with Native Americans. So there's no narrative of conquest in Iowa. So the land that became the state of Iowa had come into the hands of white Americans through conflicts like the Black Hawk War, but these conflicts had mainly taken place outside of Iowa. Iowa ends up being some of the land that ends up passing to white Americans because there's conflict someplace else. And so if you compare Iowa with some place, for instance, like my native state of Alabama, where the Crick War is an important part of, this was Native American land, and there's a Crick War, and then it was white land, right? Or in terms of the perspective of people who wrote the history, it was our land. Or if you want to compare this with, you know, Virginia, this land belonged to how hot, and then we took it, and now it's ours, right? Iowa does not have that narrative because it doesn't have that same sort of history. And so what this means is that white people in rural Iowa cannot construct that same narrative of conquest because their land actually had been vacant by the time that they arrived. It was vacant because Native Americans had lost the land before they got there, but nevertheless it was, it was vacant. They could, of course, still be part of a national racial narrative in terms of we, white people, took this land from them, but they could not be part of a statewide narrative in this way. And so what this means is for a group of people who are trying to create an identity through patriotic military conquest, the Civil War becomes even more important because it's the only sort of narrative of patriotic military conquest that they have. Not to mention the fact that it's the Civil War, the most important war in American history if, if, uh, if, of all time, if not at least until that point, right? And so this need to create this identity becomes so important that it at least partially overcomes the need for that identity to be all white. 
So African Americans can find a place in this identity of we, including African Americans, helped win this war and defend the country. And partly because African Americans themselves would not allow white Iowans to forget or to ignore their own role in crushing the rebellion. So then why is Emancipation Day so important to African Americans in particular? Part of it, in the same way that white Iowans were seeking to find out what black Southern culture was like, black Midwesterners were seeking to remember what black Southern culture was like. Also, black community leaders saw these events as a means to reinforce their authority and to reinforce their patronage connections with influential whites. There's also people who, in the same way that other folks are going to have fun, there's some people who are going to have fun in ways that some community leaders may have found embarrassing, right? Also, black veterans in the Midwest had little involvement in the Grand Army of the Republic, which was the prominent veterans organization. Some people have actually called this America's First Lobbying Group, right? The organization of that was open to all honorably discharged veterans of the, of the Union Army after the war. And the Grand Army of the Republic was so important to white Iowans that there was actually a law in Iowa saying that it was illegal for someone to wear the badge if they weren't a the member, right? That's how important this was in Iowa. But even though northern GAR posts were officially integrated, few African Americans in Iowa were involved. So these gatherings in, 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 enabled them to have their own way of celebrating their military service. And also it enabled them to strengthen the connections between communities throughout Iowa. If you have a celebration in Des Moines, people from throughout the area are going to come. If you have one in Davenport, people from all the other towns are going to come and so forth. And it enabled them to assert their collective memory of the past and their visions for the present and future. Even though the themes themselves changed between the 1860s and the 1910s, the overall message of remembering slavery and the war, celebrating progress since the war, and using this information as instructional for the present day remained constant. Or to quote from historian Kathleen Clark, quote, a meaningful arena for reflecting, enacting, and refashioning evolving identities. The testimony of the former slaves turned their uh, dehumanization, or the testimony of former slaves about their dehumanization, made the gatherings into what one reporter referred to as a quote unquote experience meeting, enabling African Americans to control their own history and explain why they deserve equal citizenship. Some of these veterans, I'm sorry, some of these speakers who were former slaves were also veterans of the war, who wore their full dress uniforms while they spoke, while others were sympathetic white community leaders who also remember these events, but obviously from a different point of view. The speakers, both black and white, also lectured the former slaves on their best course of action as free people. Here's what we should do now that we are free. As time goes on, the veterans transition from playing a leading role at these events to literally sitting in the background while younger speakers pay tribute to them. Also as time goes on, the speeches by the former slaves become more educational than commiserative. If you're in a time in the 1860s where almost every black person in attendance is a former slave, you're not educating African Americans about what slavery is like, everyone knows. But by the time you get to the 1890s, it's, you know, now you have you know, two, you know, at least two, one or two generations who have no memory of these events, and there's a need to try to educate them on what it's about. And then also there's the fact that as time goes on, white Americans are increasingly influenced by the white South version of it. So if you think about David Blight's work on how the South lost the Civil War, but they won the war, and how the war will be remembered. And African Americans look at that and say, we have to use Emancipation Day as a, as a way of making sure that our version of the story gets out, right? And so this also means that as time goes on and race relations grow increasingly hostile, speakers at Emancipation Day see a need to use the past to address present day political concerns, things that are coming up as things get, as rich relations get worse as time goes on. So to summarize all of that, black and white Iowans had social, economic, and political motives to organize and take part in Emancipation Day celebrations. Even small towns in Iowa tried to host their own gatherings, but this was not always logistically possible, especially in parts of the state where there's few or no African Americans. So for instance, how many Emancipation Day celebrations did Van Meter Township have? None. Right? because there's only you know, a few dozen in the entire state. But the McKee family found more localized ways to publicly commemorate the past, to, to accomplish some of those same goals that people are doing in larger communities, but to do it in their own way. And so 
One way to look at this is to focus on John McKee's status as a Civil War veteran. He's one of many men in Dallas County who has served in the war. He's the only African American in Dallas County who has served in the war, but many of his white neighbors were also veterans. But in the same way that his status as a landowner and the fact that his children were educated and skilled craftspersons made them respectable, his status as a veteran makes him respectable. And so to give an example of this, his children attended schools where they were the only black children um, in the entire school district. And this is shortly after Iowa's Supreme, State Supreme Court made a decision that officially desegregated the public schools, but just as what happened in the South almost a century later, other school districts around the state fought tooth and nail to keep from having to integrate. But in Van Meter Township, Dallas County, the schools seem to have been integrated with uh, little or no trouble. Another example of how the McKee situation is kind of different is the, the McKees attended an otherwise all-white Methodist church. And this is in a time and place where integrated churches are almost unheard of. So most black Iowans either um, founded their own churches, this is also one of the first things they did when they established a community, or they traveled to nearby churches, or they just didn't go to church. But the McKees attended a white church. Also, John McKee is one of the few black veterans who's involved in his local GAR um, chapter. On one occasion in the 1890s, other local members of the GIR visited the McKee farm for, quote unquote, a surprise on their old comrade, Mr. McKee, and they spent the afternoon singing and telling old stories. This comes to us from a family history that was written by John McKee's granddaughter. This account of this event does not provide the names of John's friends, but given the fact that Civil War units were racially segregated and John was the only black veteran in the entire area, this group of veterans could not possibly have reminisced on things that they did together, right? Because they would not have served together. But they served in the war, broadly speaking, together. And so, like larger Emancipation Day gatherings, this social call to the McKee Farm enabled this small group to assert their collective memory as veterans and, by implication, to assert that the very fact of remembering the war was itself worthwhile. And John's inclusion in this, and not just his inclusion, but his centrality as the unexpected host of the event showed that for his neighbors, their shared service and memories transcended race. Also, around the same time in the 1890s, John's church and J.R. Post organized a tribute to him and Madeline in the nearby town of Van Meter. The town of Van Meter is in Van Meter Township, right? According to the same family history, this event included the singing of the J.R. March song other military songs, the minstrel song, Swanee River, and a spiritual entitled Massa Lincoln. There were also speeches about the war and about Abraham Lincoln himself. The minister of the church, quote unquote, held the audience, both young and old, spellbound with an account of the McKee family's escape from slavery. And John himself offered a few remarks of gratitude. Madeline appears to not have spoken. So this gathering brought together some of the elements of Emancipation, Emancipation Day celebrations to rural Dallas County, but in a much smaller and modified form. So white participants are the ones who spoke and sang of slavery and the war. The few African Americans in attendance did not, aside from John's few remarks. And it would also seem that everyone in attendance except the McKees was also white. The, uh, the, the one account of this does not sort of say who exactly was there and what their race was, but it seems that the McKees were the only African Americans there. So in that sense, this is somewhat different from other Emancipation Day celebrations. Now there may be a simple biological reason why the McKees, why John and Madeline played such a minor role. Um, they were in their 70s at this time, and John McKee died only a few years later, and his wife died a few years after that. So it could be that their health at that point in time prevented them from doing more than sitting there and being honored and playing uh, and, and you know, offering a few remarks. This does not explain why the McKee children did not play an active role. The uh, family history makes it clear that they were there, but it doesn't say that they were otherwise involved, nor does it say um, what, they, what, what they might have done, right? But it may be that they were involved in the planning of the event. If so, their work and the contributions of John and Madeline enabled them to use their memory of the war for the same purposes that black organizers of Emancipation Day gatherings in larger towns did. And then finally, although the family history does not state that this gathering mentioned anything that had happened since the war, it focuses on the war itself and on the escape from slavery, 
the Emancipation Day theme of black uh, progress after the war is implicit in the fact that there's this land-owning black couple whose children had attended schools and had learned a trade and were locally respected business people. Meanwhile, the local whites who attended and planned the event are able to collectively express their own memories of the war to gain at least what they thought was a taste of Southern black culture and simply to gather in a small town for an entertainment event. So this becomes part of their own larger practice of public gatherings that combine patriotism, faith, and remembering the war, but they're able to use the legacy of their few black neighbors as part of this practice. I think I'm out of time now, so if I'm not, even, I'll stop there anyway. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Our uh, final presentation today is uh, by John Fry. He's an academic dean, director of the Foundation Program, and chair of the History Department, also at Trinity Christian College in Palo Heights, Illinois. He was raised on a farm in western Pennsylvania, attended uh, Geneva College, with a and he received a degree in history, has a Master of Library of Science, as well as an MA from Duquesne University, and a PhD from the University of Iowa. Um, his primary field of interest is the American West and rural history. He has two books, one an edited memoir of Laura Gibson Smith, entitled Almost Pioneers, One Couple's Homesteading Adventure in the West. He's also written The Farm Press, Reform and Rural Change, 1895-1920. He's currently writing a biography of Laura Ingalls Wilder with particular attention to her face, faith, from which the focus of this paper is. Uh, entitled Little House and the Little Church Memory and the Church and the Published Work of Laura Ingalls Wilder. John. Let's take the same slot here. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm going to switch so that nobody right. thinks you're ready. Right here. <laughs> the, um, so, thanks for all coming to, to hear me. Thanks to Nancy for putting this together. Uh, and for, to David for bringing his best stuff, as he always does. And uh, to David for uh, chairing. Uh, I also need to thank the Herbert Hoover Presidential Foundation for the provision of a travel grant to the uh, to library, the Hoover Library in West Branch, Iowa, to look at the Laura Ingalls Wilder papers uh, in the Rosewater Lane uh, papers there. And I'd also like to thank uh, my institution, Trinity Christian College, for, uh, for a summer Laura Ingalls Wilder's Little House books have delighted young and old for almost 100 years. Based on Wilder's own childhood, the novels feature clear descriptions of pioneer life in multiple Midwestern locations. Wisconsin, Kansas, Minnesota, and South Dakota from the point of view of a fictional girl who grows from a toddler into a young woman. First published during the Great Depression, their popularity during the 20th century was staggering. One recent article estimated that over 34 million copies of the books have been sold. While the books no longer have the cultural influence that they once did, there's still evidence that there's a significant group of Americans who love them. Most strikingly, when Wilder's previously unpublished memoir, Pioneer Girl, was released in 2014, Amazon.com repeatedly could not keep it in stock. Um, it's now its ninth printing, and over 165,000 copies have been sold. So, uh, as David mentioned, I'm currently working on a biography of Wilder that gives particular attention to her faith. And uh, when I was approached about being on this panel, I realized that the treatment of God, Christianity, and especially the church in Wilder's works provides an interesting case study for thinking about how individuals remember important institutions from their childhood. It also provides fruitful ground for considering the Midwestern setting of the Little House books and Wilder's life more closely. Um, there are two challenges in approaching the faith of Laura Ingalls Wilder. First, the nature of the most available evidence about Wilder's faith is conflicted. John Miller, author of the most scholarly biography of Wilder, describes her as devout and asserts that her abiding religious faith was an indispensable part of her life. However, when one reads the Little House books, there are a variety of different descriptions of the church and Christianity. Uh, some of them distinctly negative. Uh, in addition, Wilder lived for over 60 years, most of her adult life, in Mansfield, Missouri, and attended the Methodist Church there without ever becoming a member. So the first challenge is conflicting evidence. Uh, a second problem is that there is disagreement between scholars about how much to credit Wilder with the material in the Little House books, and how much to credit her daughter, Rose Wilder Lane. Wilder originally wrote the Little House books in longhand on live 
paper. Lane took the written manuscripts and typed them, editing, making changes, providing plot and narrative structure, and adding dialogue in sometimes entire scenes. Laura reviewed the typed drafts, making additional changes and at times overruling Rose's alterations. But William Holt, author of the most important biography of Lane, characterizes, characterizes her as a ghostwriter. Wilder scholars dispute this depiction. Pamela Smith Hill, the editor of Pioneer Girl, calls Lane just a skilled editor. But at any rate, there was a collaboration between the two women on the Little House books, and Lane was a confirmed agnostic during the years that the books were written. It is not at all clear that the Little House books present a faithful representation of Wilder's faith. So in, in this paper, I want to consider two examples of how God and the rural church are addressed in Wilder's works and compare passages from earlier works with parallel passages in the Little House books, uh, which are significantly different in direction and tone. I'll then suggest uh, possible explanation for the differences involving the relationship between Wilder and Lane and their regional identities. So to begin, consider an account from <clears throat> Pioneer Girl, Wilder's unpublished memoir, until recently, that she first wrote in 1930. It provides her memory of an experience she had of God's presence when she was around 11 years old. It was in the context of difficult times for the Ingalls family while they were living in Walnut Grove, Minnesota. They had lost their farm after a two-year locust infestation, and the family was living in town. Her father did odd jobs to support the family. At one point, Laura was paid to stay with a woman whose husband was frequently traveling. This meant that Wilder, as a preteen, often spent the night away from her own home. On one occasion, she was particularly troubled. Quote, the rest of the days were lonely, and I was homesick. Uh, homesick. I knew things were not going well at home because Pa could not get much work, and we needed more money to live on. One night while saying my prayers, as I always did before going to bed, this feeling of homesickness and worry was worse than usual. But gradually, I had a feeling of a hovering, encompassing presence of a power, comforting and sustaining. And I thought in surprise, this is what men call God. So this specific account does not appear anywhere in a little house. Uh, Wilder admits several of the most difficult years of her childhood from those. Um, however, a passage that describes an experience with God's presence does appear in the fifth Little House book by the shores of Silver Lake, which was published ten years after Wilder wrote Pioneer Girl. In Silver Lake, the experience is set in a completely different context. In this book, one of the key conflicts concerns whether Laura will become a teacher in order to make it possible for her blind sister Mary to attend college in Iowa. Laura knew that she did not want to teach, but in chapter 23, titled On the Pilgrim Way, during a prayer meeting at their home, she has the following experience, quote, they all knelt down by their chairs and Reverend Alden asked God, who knew their hearts and their secret thoughts, to look down on them there and to forgive their sins and help them to do right. A quietness was in the room while he spoke. Laura felt as if she were hot dry, dusty grass parching in a drought, and the quietness was a cool and gentle rain falling on her. It truly was a refreshment. Everything was simple now that she felt so cool and strong, and she would be glad to work hard and go without anything she wanted herself so that Mary could go to college. So Wilder clearly believed that God existed and that at times he visited his people. But the way that the experience is remembered and depicted in the two accounts is quite different. Pioneer Girl presents a much more straightforward description of what happened. It is more explicitly connected to God and His grace. The account in Silver Lake is more poetic, describing what Laura felt using an extended metaphor. And the account is also more concerned with the development of the book's plot. Even more striking are differences in the description of Wilder's experiences in Sunday school. Wilder and her family began attending the Congregational Church in Walnut Grove when Wilder was seven years old. Only one paragraph is devoted to Sunday school in Pioneer Girl. Quote, we love to go to Sunday school. Our teacher, Mrs. Tower, would gather us close around her and tell us Bible stories, and every Sunday she taught us a verse from the Bible that we must remember and tell her the next. Unquote. This brief description was quote, turned into a specific experience for the fourth Little House book on the banks of Plum Creek. And uh, 
it, it is available. There are some of the original manuscripts, handwritten manuscripts of uh, Little House books that are available. So I can compare what Wilder originally wrote with what was uh, eventually published um, as on the banks of Plum Creek. So in the Lord's original manuscript, the depiction of Mrs. Tower, the first Sunday school teacher, is quite positive. Quote, the lady told them her name was Mrs. Tower and learned all their names. Then she told a Bible story. There was one Ma had told Laura and Mary, so they knew it already, but they liked to hear Mrs. Tower tell them. After the story, Mrs. Tower repeated a verse from the Bible to each little girl in turn and told her to remember it and to tell it to her the next Sunday. That would be her Sunday school lesson. When Mrs. Tower came to Laura, she said, My very littlest girl must have a small lesson. It will be just three words. God is love. Can you remember that for a whole week? Laura thought she was not so small as Mrs. Tower imagined. Why, she could remember long verses and whole songs. But she wouldn't hurt Mrs. Tower's feelings by telling her that, so she answered, yes, ma'am. End of that quote. This becomes the following exchange in the published book. When the others were settled on the square of benches, the lady said her name was Mrs. Tower, and she asked their names. Then she said, now I'm going to tell you a story. Laura was very pleased, but Mrs. Tower began, it is all about a little baby born long ago in Egypt. His name was Moses. So Laura did not listen anymore. She knew all about Moses and the bulrushes. Then Mrs. Tower gives out Bible memory verses. When it was Laura's turn, she said, my very littlest girl must have a very small lesson. It will be the shortest verse in the Bible. Then Laura knew what it was, but Mrs. Tower's eyes smiled and she said, it is just three words. She said them and asked, now do you think you can remember that for a whole week? Laura was surprised at Mrs. Tower. Why, she remembered long verses and whole songs, but she did not want to hurt Mrs. Tower's feelings, so she said, yes ma'am. That's my little girl, Mrs. Tower said. I'll tell you again to help you remember. Just three words, said Mrs. Tower. Now can you say them after me? Laura squirmed. Try, Mrs. Towers urged her. Laura's head bowed lower, and she whispered the verse. That's right, Mrs. Towers said. Now will you do your best to remember and tell me next Sunday? Laura nodded. Now, the changes to this account make it much more direct. One can better feel what a little girl like Laura might have felt. It is much more effective storytelling. However, the tone of the writing and the feelings conveyed to the reader are completely different in the two accounts. In Wilder's original manuscript, Laura enjoys this new person and likes to hear her tell a story even though she's already heard it. Later, she's a little surprised at Mrs. Tower's notions, but doesn't want to hurt her feelings. In the published book, Laura is offended that she would be told such a juvenile story and tormented by Mrs. Tower's assumption that she can't memorize anything longer than several words. In addition, some of you may already have put this together, the shortest verse of the King James Bible, which was undoubtedly what we used, is only two words. Uh, Jesus wept in John 11, 35. God is love is actually part of a larger verse, 1 John 4, 8. Um, it appears that whoever made this change didn't realize that difference. Um, and it also appears that the new passage deliberately avoids including the words God is love in the story. Now, how does one explain the differences between the original manuscripts depiction of the Church of Christianity and what eventually appeared in the Little House books? I believe the examples given suggest that it was Lane who changed Wilder's straightforward and positive depictions of Christianity into the more mixed or even negative descriptions found in the published works. At least there's sort of a negative edge on the second uh, story. Wilder's memory of the Church was an affirming positive experience. Lane's memory of the Church had an edge to it. Now, Wilder did read Lane's changes before they were finalized, and at times she did argue with Lane to keep things the way she had written them, and at times she prevailed. Some of those arguments have been preserved in correspondence between the two women. But in none of the correspondence that I have seen does the depiction of Christianity come up. So it appears that Wilder has accepted Lane's changes. And I think we might explain this in one of several ways. First, Wilder may have seen this as an acceptable shift in tone. Second, Wilder may not have liked the changes, but she may have decided to choose her battles with Lane. Left these changes and then concentrated on others. 
or Wilder might have objected to the changes in conversations or correspondence that we don't have, but ultimately lost the argument. I think probably one of the first two explanations is most likely. Now, so what does this tell us about Wilder and Lane's memory of the church and of their Midwestern identity? So, if the original manuscript provides a good understanding of Wilder's memory of Christianity in the church, it's a memory of the upper Midwest when she was a child during the 1870s. The published works complicate this straightforward picture, and they, I think, involve Lane's memory of her experience with, with organized religion in Missouri, the lower Midwest of the 1890s. Now, John Miller, in a recent volume of scholarship on Wilder, argues that Wilder was shaped by her upbringing in Wisconsin, especially Minnesota and South Dakota, the upper Midwest in the 1870s, 1880s. You know, we began attending the Congregational Church, and they were active in the uh, Congregational Church in Dismat, South Dakota, so they went from Minnesota to South Dakota when she was a teenager. Um, this upper Midwest, the Wilder's early formation, was influenced by Yankee migration, open and flat landscape, park and agriculture, small towns, and mainline denominational Christianity. Wilder and her husband, Almanzo, failed at homesteading during the first five years of their marriage uh, because of drought, hail, sickness, and family tragedy. Um, they had been forced to move to town, and then uh, after abortive attempts to live in Minnesota and Florida, the family moved to Mansfield, Missouri in 1894. Now, Mansfield is in southwestern Missouri in the Ozark Mountains. Miller describes this area's influence from migration with the South, with different speech patterns, different cultural practices, and to a significant degree, different religious traditions than the upper Midwest of Wilder's youth. The Wilders attended, but never joined the local Methodist church. Wilder's daughter Rose was brought up in this church in the lower Midwest. Now, by her own admission, Lane had an unchanted happy childhood. In late 1926, she wrote in an article in Cosmopolitan, quote, I was not a happy child, Few children are happy. The myth of happy childhood is created by adults." Unquote. Now, Lane's, Lane's biographer Holtz describes struggles that she had with her parents, her school teachers, and the community of Mansfield, especially during her teenage years. The family was poor, and Rose felt like an outsider. She left home as early as she could, even before she had finished high school. She spent her last year of high school with an aunt in Louisiana, then returned to Mansfield for the summer, then departed for a job as a hotel telegrapher in Kansas City. Within several years, she was living in San Francisco. I have no direct evidence that she had a particularly bad experience at the Methodist Church her family attended in Mansfield, but she stopped attending worship services when she left home and did not return to the church until she was over 60 years old. Uh, so it's my plan to look at all of Wilder's original manuscripts to see if similar changes were made to the depictions of religion in other books, and it's my hope that some of those gathered here can provide me with suggestions for additional context in which to place Wilder's engagement with her memories of the church, Christianity, and God. Thank you. I'm going to have a few brief comments, yeah, and then we'll I'll do that. Uh, then we'll turn it up. Then we'll come back. But I did uh, edit them down a little bit again. So just want to say a few comments, maybe see what threads we can have together. And then we'll, uh, I have some questions built into here, and then hopefully some of you will have questions, and uh, uh, we'll go from there. So I think all three th of these papers address the issue of rural Midwest identity formation in the late 19th century and early 20th century. Steering clear of nostalgia or heritage, these papers instead interrogate the process by which rural Midwesterners made sense of their world and constructed an identity as heartland people. By examining how they told stories about the past, our panelists invite us to think about how those in the heartland understood themselves in the past. The people in rural Midwest had not just been the objects of others' definitions of what it means to be Midwestern, but actively constructed their own ideas about the region and its place in the United States. And these papers all point to the importance of keeping an ear close to the ground to understand the way people themselves themselves understood their lives in the rural Midwest. I'll skip the paragraphs that state what you said. <laughs> so, but I think all three papers provide these helpful angles to examine the way people in the rural Midwest remember that past it. But I also think all three papers could be benefit uh, from a for, more fine-grained analysis of the local situation. I wonder, for instance, Nancy, what was happening um, in the social and economic lives of those in Carroll County in the 1920s? 
right? Uh, were there real problems or just a fear of losing something? Additionally, are there details about the producers and the audience that might help us understand these people and the stories they told about themselves? Um, and as someone who's read lots of pageants, that's very hard to track down, like who actually did this. But, it, but, but there might be some details there that, that will flush this out. For David, uh, what's happening in Dallas County? And what's the fuller story of the McKees from the 1870s to the 1910s? How are they experiencing these changes? Um, additionally, I wonder, do Iowans particularly tell the story of their efforts in the Civil War not only as pro-Union and pro-the North, but also uh, as anti-slavery and maybe as anti-racism to show how progressive they might be? Uh, there's another aspect there that I kept hoping for. And finally, John, how does Laura engage in that local church during the time she's writing the books in the 1920s, or well, into the 30s? Uh, what is the theology of a local church, and how does this relate to the larger context of religion in the era uh, when she is writing? And might the memory of the role of the church in her life be more shaped by the present than what actually happened in the past? I also think all three papers could be strengthened by a more close examination of how memory of the past shape, shapes actions or reflects values that they can no longer live out. For instance, I'm thinking of the patents, right? So how, do, how does their hope that they could keep progressing maybe overshadow the reality of what, what life is happening in the, in the rural areas? Of course, memory, identity, and religious ideas mattered, but how did they matter? Can we as historians connect more closely with people's self-identity built on collective memory to both their actions or inability to act in the ways they desire? And how does identity as a rural Midwestern shape how they encounter the world and made life decisions about where to live, whom to marry, who to associate, how to vote, et cetera, et cetera? Or, again, alternatively, their inability to do as they had hoped. As we continue then to research and write about the history of rural Midwest, our challenge will be continue to interrogate how people on the ground understood their place in the world and how that identity interacted with the, their lived experience. I look forward to a discussion, a robust discussion, about how people in the rural Midwest in the past remembered their past. So, open that up. I don't know if you want to come back up here so we can um, answer some of those questions or open it up to other um, questions that our uh, audience has uh, thought about. We'll switch these back. I don't know if my questions made any sense or if anybody wanted to respond to that, then we'll take a question. Or we want to start with the question. All right, we'll start with the question. John, did you by any chance turn up any more records on that with the man's skilled methods and others writing on that? Well, I, that's not been something that I've concentrated on yet. Yeah, yeah. yeah Nancy Fraser gave me some ideas about some people to talk to. But uh, Nancy Fraser is ready. It just wrote me like a 400 page biography. Oh, Caroline. Uh, so, so, okay, it's Caroline. Yeah. My, my, my bad. Caroline Fraser gave me some ideas. Um, but yeah. There just don't seem to be records in the, the last assistant at the Wild and Home to the curator. Was the supply Methodist minister there? Oh, really? And we asked her to go scour through, and it's just, I don't think we have any records. Um, you know, we just have like a hearsay of their uh, participation there. Yeah, yeah, there's that, that interview with their one pastor. And, yeah, uh, and at, you know, at that. That's pretty the, late in the game. The word got through because the, those who were were so alive in the last few decades, or the very few that are so alive, said that they had the impression they weren't church goers and they were therefore bad people. Well, what it was is he just got so lame who would go up the steps to the church and he was deaf and it didn't do him any good and he drove, so they just stayed home. And then when he died, then she resumed going to church. So you can see how people's unholiness gets misinterpreted, <laughs> yeah. passed around. Because 
they would have been in church. It was a social activity. And it was communication. Right, and she went to, and she, you know, after he died, she, she went, went back. back. Went, yeah, one of the next went to back. back. Yeah. Picked her up and took her to church every Sunday that she was able. So there was that gap when he was just in his decline. But I wonder if, if part of the answer is not just that particular church, but Methodism in Southwest Missouri at the time to kind of a, a bigger, like, well, how were Methodists at that time in that place? Sure, sure, that's a good question. Well, that's, that, it, you know, because sometimes you have to go out a little bit to get the big conference. In that community, you know, the Baptists and the many, many good forms, they really were the strength. And the Presbyterians and the Methodists were the other two. Protestant organizations, and they were a smaller congregation. Thank you. David, did you, have you done any research at all about the descendants? Were they continuing to be accepted in Dallas County? Did they keep, you know, they're obviously, they got an education in the white schools. Did their kids continue to go to those schools? Did they stay? Did they leave? Actually, yeah, they left. Um, so, John McKee dies in the late 1890s, and then Madeline McKee dies in, I think, 1906. And after that, but at that point, the children are all young adults. Um, they all moved to Des Moines, you know, which is, um, you know, it's, it's fun. This is rural life, I guess. Des Moines is not that far away. Like, if you're in a car, you wouldn't think it would be that far away. But back in those days, that, that's, that's quite a ways. But by then, you know, a lot of people were in Des Moines, and, and that's where the family actually still lives there. Um, the reason why we have all this great stuff is because the granddaughter who wrote this history, um, when she died about 20 years ago, they don't, the family donated all of her stuff uh, to the State Historical Society. But uh, yeah, they're still in Des Moines. Um, so they, yeah, they, they, they're landowners, but you know, none of the children wanted to, you know, stay farmers, and so, um, and then after that, you know, that township went back to being um, all white again, which it pretty much still is. And that's like that county is now sort of a suburb of Des Moines, but that part of the county is still pretty darn rural. Uh, this, <coughs> excuse me, this question is for Nancy and for David, I think. Um, so. And it's also has to do with some of the other speakers that we heard today. You know, how far has the memory of farming whitewashed the history of farming? And I'm asking that because I was surprised by your story. I mean, so we're very familiar, I guess, as a story with, with the Great Migration, which, which basically turns the African American experience into an urban one. Um, but prior to that, in the late 19th century, we do have the Black Town Movement and farmer, black farmers in Iowa. I mean, the family owned land, yeah. right? So there's also, like, there, we don't have much of a story, I guess, of, of African Americans moving away from the South without becoming farmers. One of these pageants to me sound like white affairs as well. Um, so that almost the, the history of farming in this country becomes. What was the last sentence you said? Well, the history of farming becomes white, a white history, as the pageants seem a whitening of history. And I, in, in relation, I was thinking almost of those, um, or almost I was thinking of those, those uh, eugenics, healthy family pageants that also were happening at the same time. Is it the whole history of, of the country has been whitewashed? The country, I mean, the rural area, not the nation. That's more a statement than a question. Well, I think that's a that's a really good point that that would need to be made in, in any larger work, and um, that sort of uh, broader context I think is important to to also understanding why these narratives get reproduced over and over again. I mean, that's also a question I'm interested in: the sort of dominant theories or do, excuse me, dominant narratives, and the places where publics learn these histories. So um, you know, this is clearly a whitewashed history. Um, the organization that I'm talking about was primarily um, in the Midwest, in the North, made up of white farmers, farm people. 
um, and that's the only, the only story that she used to tell. Um, nevertheless, um, you know, that there, there are other things you can tell within the construction of a white um, narrative um, that privilege certain things um, and leave other things out that, you know, have, have been left out of that dominant narrative, as I pointed out, um, you know, women, Native Americans. And I think, you know, by the, by the early 20th century, we're getting this, I wonder if we're getting this homogenized story of what, it, it's becoming more clear that near, what that national narrative is, and more and more people are buying into the same narrative, I wonder. Um, that's part of the, the result of mass culture, the result of the, the, the growing sense of nation in, the, um, in that period. Um, so that's also something I think is also needed. And I don't quite know how to uh, relate that to regionalism and identity. I don't even get there um, or ask that question, but I think that has to be thought about also, too, is you know, the 20th century rise in nationalism and national culture and mass culture. And what that does to general identity. I think um, it's, it's, a, it's a really good point. I, I think that certainly there, there's this idea that black people farm but not as landowners and not in the north. So certainly, you know, the, the image of, of slavery is, you know, is agrarian slavery to the point that when you try to talk about urban slavery, people are like, what do you mean there's slaves in like Atlanta? Like it's still in Georgia, it's in slavery, right? But um, certainly there's that part of it and then you have sharecroppers afterwards, but black landowners doesn't seem to sort of really fit into the dominant narrative. And then when it comes to the North, there's not really a sense of black people as farmers at all. And maybe part of the reason for that is that if you're celebrating the black, if you celebrate farmers, I should say, as industrious, hardworking, taking something that was wild and untamed and making it better, and this is the backbone of the country, but then you simultaneously think that black people do not have those qualities, then you cannot have a narrative in which black people do those same things, right? I think also, to be fair, though, is um, there certainly there were parts of the North that were like completely white or overwhelmingly white. So you can be, and I don't know the, the racial makeup of like the Cobb County or Carroll County back then, but you know, there's there's counties in Iowa that if you want to go by the census, did not have black residents like at all, ever listed on any census until like 18, 1980, 1990, 2000, right? So there's places where at least like every 10 years, like literally a black person never lived there, right? And who, if, they, if there was maybe one or two, maybe they were farmers, maybe they weren't, but you can be in certain parts of the north and sort of celebrate the local agrarian culture and have that be completely white and you're not actually lying about it, right? <laughs> now if you're trying to have that be part of a broader narrative about like we as Westerners or whatever, then you're being exclusionary by having to be an all-white story. But you know, it seems like you know, one of the things I like about your paper is the way it's sort of it's local and it's also regional and national. And so it's like we is Carroll County, but we is also like America, right? Um, and so, you know, if the, the, the we that is your county, your county's all white, then your story's gonna be all white as well, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, there's certainly, um, there's growing work on, on sort of northern black, uh, well, first, the, the, the next century black Midwest period, but even more so like, you know, the rural black 19th century Midwest, but it's, it's not that well known. Um, and certainly it's not part of any sort of collective memory. I think in 1920, the census says I think there were something like 650 um, black farmers in Illinois. So it was yeah. very small. Yeah, so in the whole county, not, or in the whole state. In the whole state. state. Yeah, yeah. That's mostly down state, right? yeah. not, not in the county, right? I have a question for David as well. Um, I know, um, you talked about the emancipation days. Um, I have recently learned about the physical memorial, memorial of the Civil War. And we talked a lot about in one of my classes the perpetration of like the white savior and stereotypes in statues and things as well as like mammies and all of that and i was just curious as to how that played into like in iowa when you talked about the mcgee family mcgee yeah. um how they um if there were any examples of physical memorials um because you talked about the regiments too and black veterans how if they had any control of that sort of thing in iowa or if that's just more in larger metropolitan areas there's certainly um 
there are sort of civil war memorials all over Iowa. I mean, a, a lot of you know Midwestern communities will have some sort of like at this point, maybe some of the oldest like physical structures in town might be whatever civil war memorial was put up in the 1880s or the 1890s, and maybe they'll have like the names of the battles listed. You know, in some cases they'll have the names of people who were, who were from an area who died. Um, and if you know somebody is African American, then maybe they'd be included in that as well. Otherwise, you don't have a lot of like physical mon monuments to this. Um, in terms of the other part of your question, like the white savior thing, I mean, I think you can see that in the McKee gathering, right, where they spent more time talking about Lincoln than they did about the McKees, right? They they sung a song about him, and the minister told a story. I didn't go into the specifics, but the story about Lincoln was actually like about Lincoln's childhood, right? Fascinating, but what does Lincoln's boyhood in Indiana have to do with you know, the McKees escaping from slavery? Um, not much, except in the sense of here's like you know our way of celebrating our, our national great martyr, right? Who's the reason why these people sit here today are free, right? Even though technically speaking, he's not because they had run off before the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect. But you know details, right? So um, that's definitely um, that's definitely a part of like the broader Emancipation Day thing. I mean. And to be fair, I mean, everybody, you know, was just in the North, you know, all sorts of patriotic gatherings and community gatherings were memorializing Lincoln, right? He's just, he, he's a big part of, you know, of everything, right? Um, but in terms of Emancipation Day, yeah, there's a huge emphasis on, you know, visual, in terms of speeches, in terms of songs, on the fact that Lincoln freed the slaves, Lincoln won the war, and Lincoln gave his life to save the country, and all that sort of thing. Um, and in, in terms of like broadening out, broadening out the white savior thing, there's actually some debate about that in terms of different emancipation days. So there's some people who will get up and say, you know, darn those Democrats, they tried to enslave us, but thank God for the Republican Party. And then there's other speakers who would stand up and say, the Democrats helped too, right? And sometimes it will be African Americans who stand up and say the Democrats helped too. Um, and so they sort of go back and forth in terms of like which white people should we give thanks to for the fact that we're free now, right? Uh, was this uh, McKee, is that his name? Yeah, it's, it, the part of the reason why they're so darn hard to, to track down, I've seen, seen the names spelled like five different ways. Okay. McKee, well, McGee, McGee with an H, it's just, it's like. My nuts. question is, uh, when he served, was he in an Iowa regiment or was he in a black regiment? He's in a black regiment, and this is part of the reason why they're hard to track, why he's hard to track down. I'm actually still not even sure which black regiment he served in. Um, you know, the family narrator says he went back east. That's not very helpful. He right? <laughs> doesn't, doesn't exactly narrow it down a lot, right? So, you know, he, he did not serve in the 60th U.S. Colored Infantry. Um, and I'm to the point where, like, I'm trying, basically, like, I'm literally going through every black regiment that was on an East Coast state and trying to find anybody named McGee or McGee with an H or McKee or, you know, M-C-K-I-E-G-H, like every possible derivation of that Irish name that I can find. You know which one of them is John McKee, right? Um, but, but, but he wasn't in the city, he wasn't in Iowa's black regiment. Okay. Well, did Iowa have a black regiment? Yes. But uh, but the local folks who celebrated with him obviously recognized that he served somewhere. Right. And they would all almost all would have served in one of Iowa's regiments, right? Um, you know, there's there's some white veterans who served elsewhere who were not from Iowa before the war, and they come to Iowa after the war. But most of the people who were in, most of the white people who were in Iowa after the war had been in Iowa before the war, and they had served in Iowa regiments. But, um, and that's true of most of the black veterans as well, but not this one. All right. We've got our last question, and then we'll wrap it up. Okay. Did you check the pension when he applied for his pension, federal pension, uh, on the pension records? A lot of times they have to put in what regiment they serve in. Right. The, the problem is that I have to know which McKee he is first before I can do but there, you may be able to find, because the pension records show him being paid in the town, right. or that way backwards. That's a thought. Was there an underground railroad in Iowa? There was, and there was in central Iowa, not specifically in that exact part, but um, you know, this is fairly close to Missouri, and it's, you know, you get you get to the point, you get on the train, you go to Chicago um, from there. So that broadly speaking, in that part of the state, yeah, there Excellent. I think I answered too many questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you to our panelists again, and thank you for coming.